Hello, I'm Andrew Blick. I'm Senior Research Fellow at Federal Trust and Reader in Politics and Contemporary History, King's College London. Today, I'm interviewing John Palmer. Uh, John Palmer was for many years the European editor of The Guardian, based in Brussels. He was a founder and former political director of the European Policy Centre, the Brussels-based think tank and, research, and policy research institute. He now lives in London and is a member of the Federal Trust Council. Uh, thanks, thanks for talking me to me today, John. Uh, morning, Andrew. Uh, morning, morning. Now, the first question I wanted to, to start with today in our conversation was this phrase that's been used recently by the, the economist of the untied kingdom. Do you think it's an apt description of the present situation we find ourselves in in the UK? And, and is it possible that in 10 years' time, very little will have changed in the configuration of the UK because change would be even more painful than the maintenance of the status quo. Yes, well, I think that the economists uh, are right to say that uh, the, ba the, the sinews that bound the, the different uh, nations uh, of the UK Union together are weakening and unravelling. Uh, I've heard others uh, uh, describe it as the melting of an iceberg, uh, which takes time, but tends to proceed uh, at a, uh, an ever faster pace the longer it goes on. Uh, either way, I think that over the next decade, uh, the likelihood rather than the unlikelihood is that there will be a, an unraveling of the UK Union. I think that we are fairly advanced on that in terms of the situation in Scotland, not because the opinion poll majority uh, uh, forecasts are huge uh, for independence, uh, they're not more than marginal, but as with other uh, nations of the European, uh, of the United Kingdom, um, what these figures tend to miss is that apart from the political parties in the case of Scotland, the SNP and the Greens, who openly advocate independence, there are significant proportions of the membership of uh, at least the Scottish Labour Party, which is opposed to the SNP and will oppose them in the forthcoming election, who are increasingly sympathetic to independence. Indeed, I saw a few days ago uh, that uh, uh, figures showing that uh, voters and supporters of the Welsh Labour Party, which is opposed to independence, but seeking uh, a further radical devolution of uh, authority, themselves are sympathetic to uh, independence. But perhaps the most important thing, we can deal with Ireland, which is a slightly different case in a second, perhaps the most interesting figures are that the younger the demographic, uh, uh, under 40, especially under 30, that the majorities are large, substantial and growing. That is true of uh, both Scotland and, and Wales. Uh, so that this suggests that playing um, negotiations on a new relationship uh, outside the union in the long, for the long term, uh, carries risks for government, uh, that it may become more difficult, not easier, in five or ten years' time to revisit the question than it would be to try and resolve it in the nearer future. In the case of Northern Ireland, I think the demographic trends are above all the impact of Brexit, which is common to all these nations' relationships with the UK and their changing attitude to it, uh, uh, work in, in a not dissimilar way the most important demographic in Northern Ireland is the growth of a substantial proportion of the electorate that does not identify confessionally uh, Protestant Catholic. Uh, it, it, it is independent of that. And that demographic in large measure begins to express itself through parties outside the traditionally aligned Republican nationalist, uh, unionist, uh, 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 loyalist division. Uh, Alliance being one case, the Greens again being another, uh, and they are in certain circumstances since uh, Brexit more open to proposals that clearly lead step by step rather than one big swoop towards uh, unification. Good, and we'll, we'll come back to Northern Ireland as you suggested later on, but I think uh, 
there's also the EU is potentially a factor in all of this. And what do you think the attitude of the EU might be towards the prospect of an independent Scotland, or indeed, as you suggest, perhaps longer term, but the prospect of, of, an, of an independent Wales? Yes, I'm not sure how much consideration has been given to the Welsh question, though, of course, there is a very active Welsh uh, lobby in Brussels and uh, with uh, uh, some of whose members have a lot of experience in the EU institutions themselves. Um, but I think in the case of Scotland, my understanding is that informal Nego not negotiations, but dialogue between uh, the Scottish government uh, representatives and the EU Commission stroke council uh, is that um, they would have no objection in principle uh, to negotiating a potentially a future potential membership of Scotland in the EU if there was a constitutionally valid referendum uh, to authorize that decision. That would suggest uh, they are anxious to avoid a Catalan situation where Madrid has refused, despite majorities in Catalonia in favor of uh, such a referendum, uh, to agree to it. And that has been a blockage. So um, the British government, I guess, could play that card. But since um, the situation is rather different, and since the Scottish vote uh, support for independence might get more radical if a democratic mandate is not given uh, for a referendum, my own personal view is that if they can't win it quickly, a referendum, and that may be their best bet to go for a quick referendum to have any chance of winning it, uh, the British government will have to accept the inevitability of uh, a referendum later. And that would open the way uh, constitutionally for the council to approve the commission uh, going ahead with negotiations. They would be very complex. They might go through an, int uh, this is my guesstimate, not directly. They might go through a, a transitional phase where uh, Scotland uh, participates fully in the single market and the customs union, while negotiations, for instance, go on to the more difficult questions of detaching from sterling or perhaps retaining a transitional link with sterling like the Irish Free State did, like the Irish Free State did after 1922 until uh, the post-war years. So uh, there are different modalities in all of this, but I think the direction of travel is becoming rather clearer. Okay, and the, the, the Catalonian comparison is often one that's drawn. I suppose the difference now is that uh, the remaining UK will not be a member of the EU when these decisions are being made, whereas you know the remaining Spain in this in an equivalent scenario would be. So it, it, it changes the dynamics somewhat, I should imagine. That's uh, right. So on on to Ireland. Does the British government have a strategy for Northern Ireland, and if so, what is it? Will it work on its own terms? Well, if they have a strategy, uh, they have kept it very successfully secret from everybody, including people at the highest level, as far as I can see, in the British government. My suspicion is that they don't have such a strategy, that the last 12 months uh, uh, have been extemporization after extemporization. It goes back... Uh, to the misjudgment that the Prime Minister Boris Johnson made in deciding to undermine, fatally undermine, under pressure from the Democratic Unionist Party in the North of Ireland, uh, uh, the then Prime Minister's uh, plan uh, that the terms of Brexit would be significantly different in that the UK would accept adherence to the spirit and the direction of uh, the European Union's regulations regarding the single market and the customs union. That would have disappeared, well, it, it would have prevented the appearance at all of any North Sea Irish, uh, uh, Irish Sea uh, border controls between GB and Northern Ireland, which are uh, uh, a burdensome and complicated and increasingly difficult uh, uh, set of arrangements. Um, and one which uh, now uh, uh, the more militant wing of loyalism has taken up as a, a cause 
celebre uh, to justify the riots that we've seen recently. Uh, this is doing quite serious damage, I suspect, to the DUP's own electoral base, which may emerge uh, with future elections uh, in, in, in Northern Ireland. But, but I think in the case, if I may say, in the case of Northern Ireland, this is not a matter that will be resolved in one dramatic historic moment. I think we're looking at possibly a decade-long, seven years plus uh, uh, process, which you can begin to identify could have visible different stages. The first, which is already acknowledged, is the need to put substance into the agreed formula of a shared island. island. Uh, that has with it all the uh, unresolved issues about 32 county all Ireland infrastructure, where there is a common interest and an urgent interest west of the River Band in Northern Ireland, but also in the Republic, where there is a significant gulf between the Dublin conurbation, uh, the East Coast rapid development, uh, rapid modernization, and the growing uh, problems of the interior in the southern province of Munster, the western province of Connacht, the northwest, that is to say, the part of Ulster that is in the Republic, and parts of the Midlands. All of those speak to the need for quite widespread coordination uh, on, on infrastructure, economic development, and now health with the COVID crisis, uh, there is uh, the, the joint coordination of vaccine production and purchase. There's a myriad of questions. There is a lot of support for that on both sides of the border. Finding a formula that is not too uh, um, uh, aggravating to unionists as being a precursor to inevitable unification is the problem. The second stage, which might overlap with this, is one in which both sides look at constitutional changes in their own system of governance. The question of identity, the question of uh, how, uh, for example, in uh, the north of Ireland, British identity of those citizens that wish to uh, retain British identity should be respected, enshrined in law, uh, uh, given uh, constitutional status, etc. Um, interestingly, the largest demand for Irish passports since the Brexit result in uh, Northern Ireland has been from uh, people of British identity in the Northern Ireland who want at least an Irish second passport. So you can see that there are sensitive issues there, but they will come on stream, I think, a little bit later. And then finally, there is the most difficult question, which is premature to decide in the immediate future, how the terms of such a referendum might be actually formulated. Yeah, and and I think parallel to all those all those tendencies you're talking about, we've we've had words and noises coming out of the UK government that suggest that either not they're not fully uh, aware of what the, what's in the Belfast Good Faith Agreement, or are actually willfully saying things which appear to contradict either elements of it or underpinning assumptions of it. And of course, you could argue Brexit itself is a challenge. With that kind of thing going on, how is this playing out externally? We've talked about what might be the UK strategy, but how, for instance, is the US viewing this? How is the Republic viewing this? And what difference is that likely to make? Well, I think it's clear from what President Biden has already said, and it was, it was uh, not exactly a surprise, uh, that the Biden administration will keep a very close eye on the practical implementation of the Good Friday Agreement in all respects, including the matters that are uh, identified in that agreement for future discussion between the parties. They'll want those discussions, uh, visible progress and perceptible uh, dynamism be, be, uh, uh, behind it. I think that this is the most acute problem for the Johnson cabinet. Uh, we have an extraordinary situation at the moment where uh, talk of treachery and um, perfidious Albion in Northern Ireland is coming from the loyalists rather than the Republicans. Uh, they believe, and the DUP believes, it was completely sold down the river <coughs> by the tactics that Johnson adopted and the disingenuous, I think, to say the least, uh, guarantees that he gave prior to the referendum. I think that has shifted something 
fairly important in the whole landscape in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and uh, you, there is now a very active debate going on within the broader unionist community, uh, by which I mean people who don't are not members of unionist parties, but uh, are have personal and family and uh, traditions uh, with British identity, they're beginning to say, look, we've got to talk. We've got to, we can't pretend that negotiations and discussions about how the two sides live together in Northern Ireland, how a united Ireland, uh, how the all 32 counties have common problems that need urgent tackling now, and the potential for a, a future decision on unification. We can't turn our eyes away from this. It's got to be confronted. Nobody is, there's lots of opinions among the Unionist Committee about how it should be confronted, but there is no one single line any longer, you know, sort of thus far, but no further, no surrender. That 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 iceberg, I think, is visibly melting. Okay, so you, you're seeing some more coalescence there, but in, in terms of the Republic and the wider EU, is there divergence there? Is, is there a difference of, of attitude as to how the UK should be approached around these issues? Um, no, I don't think. I think that it, it, it isn't the case that the Dublin government wants to proceed at a faster pace than um, even the moderate middle of the road in Northern Ireland think is advisable. I think they'll take a very, are taking rather, a very cautious step-by-step -step approach. And they're certainly uh, wanting to do nothing that polarizes the debate further. At some point, uh, there will have to be, for instance, in the Republic, a serious discussion about its own constitution, about its symbols, about uh, uh, it, it, its traditional iconography of Irish identity. Um, in this new situation where in a year or two, uh, hopefully discussions about a shared island will be much further advanced. So I think that it's, it's, it's all open at the moment uh, uh, for discussion. There, I, I come back to the point among the, among the younger demographic in Northern Ireland, uh, there is a, a dissatisfaction and, uh, and an impatience with the frozen character of official formal political debate. So I think that is also pushing uh, for, for changes. And in the Republic, as I said, don't underestimate uh, the desire perhaps to use the dialogue about a shared island to shift some of the over-centralized characteristics of, of the, the, the government, of the constitution in the Republic. Now, in the curse case of the European Union, <clears throat> I don't think they want to play a leading role at this stage in determining or shaping or influencing this dialogue, but they have a huge interest in it taking place peacefully. Uh, I have a, a hunch, it's no more than that, that uh, as time passes, uh, and the arrangements governing trade between the GB and Northern Ireland will not change significantly for as long as the British government cannot commit to broad acceptance of the terms of, and standards that inspire the single market and customs union, that there will be pressure to say, well, perhaps we can go this far, uh, that um, we will make possible um, a, a sort of Norwegian style deal uh, uh, which uh, would immediately remove the northern uh, the uh, Irish Sea border. That might be capable of being sold in London as coming to the rescue of the Unionists, paradoxically, right. because they'd say, "This is going to we're going to sweep it away." We've come. They could dress up language that disguises the key factor that they would be expected to identify uh, with the, the standards and so on. Uh, there will be people on the hard Brexit side that will oppose that, and I don't know which way that will go. But I can see that this prime minister, who thinks short term and opportunistically as a matter of habit, uh, might be attracted at some point to such a, a an intervention, uh, uh, perhaps not in the next month, but in the next year or so. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see how in logic that that could make sense. And, you know, obviously the, the present prime minister 
is is capable of adopting a range of different positions. The the government we've got right now, with the people we've got in the jobs, such as Lord Frost, and the particular tone they're taking, seems to point in the direction of non potentially non fulfilment of the protocol. And my my question there would be: Could that potentially open up a wedge between the Republic and the EU in the sense that at some point? The EU may feel they have to protect the integrity of the single market. And if they can't do it in the Irish Sea, where are they going to do it? It puts them, in, it does raise, and I, I wonder, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I wonder, is there potential there for a real crunch? Or maybe the EU will find another way of applying pressure to the UK in more terms of more general measures. I don't know. But is there, is there potential for a, for a divergence there, do you think? And that could be a real problem. Well, certainly anything like that would pose a very serious problem indeed. Uh, I don't detect any mood in Brussels uh, 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 to go down that road. Least of all now that we have a new administration in Washington, there might have been some who would have said with the Trump administration, look, it's a pity we have to do this, but maybe it's necessary. Uh, I don't think so. I don't see any sign of it. There may be, look, uh, the regulations governing uh, food and animal welfare standards are, in a bureaucratic sense, very complex. They might well be simplified. <clears throat> My understanding of the present talks is that that, it, it, that that is what they're about. So they might come up with something that uh, won't satisfy the hardliners, but may indicate a sufficient goodwill to streamline some of these procedures. But when you look at the infrastructure in Belfast to manage this process, it's formidable already. This is not something I think that will be susceptible to being transformed by um, online um, registration with documentation oh. rather than physical documentation. But they probably will try to go some way to ease things uh, uh, in that context yeah and if, it, if it's that easy to do it what's the eu about and what's the single market about i mean yeah the, so uh okay now moving to uh scotland again uh, i suppose the general question here is brexit may have made scottish independence politically more attractive but has it made it technically more difficult to actually achieve well um again uh, I'm sure there are many uh, uh, difficult problems uh, to be overcome. My own reading of it is that the most difficult issue are those that surround the currency. <clears throat> There's no question about that. And one could imagine um, <clears throat> a situation in which, um, uh, although in the, let's assume other issues are resolved, Scotland in the European Union would not be in a position immediately to join the single currency. This is to ignore all the other problems that will exist anyway with any kind of a border uh, between uh, uh, England, Wales and Scotland. But I can imagine that um, there could be uh, a, a, maybe a, a Swedish solution um, uh, which, uh, under which uh, in the Irish case uh, the, in the Scottish case, I beg your pardon, in the Scottish case, the Scottish government accepts the use of sterling as their interim transitional currency. Uh, that would mean they would have no monetary autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the central bank, the Bank of England or the Treasury. Uh, but I come back to my point, which I think has escaped a lot of people in this context. After 19, uh, the 21, 22 in Ireland with the introduction of the free state, uh, sterling, uh, the Irish uh, pound was entirely linked to and was a side product of British monetary policy. And that meant they didn't independently control interest rates, uh, at, at, let alone other more innovative uh, facets of monetary policy. I think it's not beyond the realm of possibility that for a period, one, two, three, five I, you know, years, whatever, uh, that this was done while the more fundamental adjustment of the Scottish economy took place, which would permit uh, accession to the single currency, perhaps a period of years after accession. There is one factor, again, which seems on the surface not directly linked, 
but I was looking at a report that the Chinese uh, uh, have produced uh, about, which is a consequence of Arctic melt and the opening up of the uh, North Atlantic uh, into the North Pacific as a shipping, uh, as a major shipping route. Already it's beginning, it's, it's, not, um, it's not fiction. Um, and the uh, investment in Denmark in their northern ports is immense. And I think this has been identified um, by the Scots and no doubt in Brussels as well as um, a significant asset uh, for the future economic development, that there is a northern dividend. I mean, I have no idea whether climatology will sustain this, but it looks as though a major new dynamic uh, in terms of the movement of goods and trade across uh, north of Russia into the northern Pacific is now a serious potential in a decade's time, the way things are going. So you have all those factors coming in, which are not directly related to the monetary question, but speak to the possibility of a staged process of integration. Okay. I mean, and I suppose one difference with the Irish Free State was it wasn't joining an EU with its own customs union and its own single market. Yep. If Scotland's joining the EU, and if the remaining UK, however small that will be, perhaps it will be England, you know, who knows, but is, is as is currently projected, may not work out in reality, as is currently projected, is striking its own uh, trade deals, is pursuing its own regulations, you're going to get an increasing distance between uh, remaining UK and EU. And Scotland, if they're in the EU, are going to be in the EU. And you're going to see a barrier and the same the same challenge we're facing with Northern Ireland. Where do you put the barrier? Well, the barrier is quite clearly going to be between England and Scotland. If Scotland yeah. is, and that's the trade barrier. So that's why I think you know, there was some not to say any of this is impossible. And who knows what will be going on over the next you know five to 10 years. But I think that in my view, there's an issue there that uh, how would that work? And that's that is a, that is an economic problem for an independent Scotland, I guess, because a lot of their trade. If, once you start looking at the idea of there being international trade between Scotland and England is quite a, quite a large volume. So, I mean, we will see, won't we, if, if, that, if that comes to pass. It, it is a pressure point on the Scottish government, but it's also a pressure point on the London government, Indeed. which is why um, um, uh, it may well be that if the referendum is won when it took, took place for independence, so a new reality is born, that will focus the minds of those in Whitehall who would say, perhaps it's time for us to relook at the precise terms of how we can give more assurance to the European Union of de facto alignment with basic standards uh, and uh, rules governing the, the customs union and the single market. Now, yes, that would be a significant shift in the British government's position, but I wouldn't underestimate the pressure that both Scottish independence and developments in the European Union UK relationship coming together in this conjuncture might allow, um, I don't know, people associated maybe with Gove and so on. I'm only, in, I'm only guesstimating uh, this is pure speculation to say, well, look, we're in a new situation. We have, a, we, we would suffer from this uh, uh, trade barrier as well as the Scots. Maybe there is some way we can facilitate it. Uh, uh, all, one, all, all that one can say is that the pressure is not just one way on Edinburgh. The pressure on this development would be two ways with Whitehall and Westminster as well. Yeah. And that's all fascinating. I suppose the kind of prior question to that is, how do we get there? We're going to have an election very soon in, in Scotland that it's you know, entirely plausible that there'll be some kind of majority in the Scottish Parliament for a referendum, indeed a majority for independence, but certainly a majority for a referendum. Uh, to, how do we get from there to a referendum actually happening? And I know there's been some speculation that, that Boris might come forward with some kind of referendum on his own that you know, imposes the kind of uh, requirements that we never had for the EU referendum. But you know, how do we get there? How do you see that happening? Yes, good question. And I, I don't have a, a, a clear picture in my own mind about that. I suspect 
that there is a fairly frantic amount of thinking on just that question going on at the moment. Uh, because uh, since the EU referendum, the government has motored on uh, a rapidly diminishing tank of fuel on ideas about how this whole thing is to be handled. Um, yes, I could see there is a strong lobby or there might be a strong lobby for saying, let's go for a dramatic intervention, uh, home rule plus, 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 uh, 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 in, in the way that in 1910, 1912, it would have been possible uh, for the British government to have done heading off, uh, to head off what became a tidal wave of movement for Irish independence. Such a thing is possible, but it would disturb so much of the settled party political um, consensus post-Brexit. It would have to involve, by the way, the idea that you could do something dramatic for Scotland that you didn't do for the other nations would be for the birds. But more important than that, I think this is where England, England becomes a major player. It is no coincidence. Look, look at the latest opinion poll in Hartlepool. It may be that Labour loses because of a significant number of votes going to the Northern Independence Party. Uh, now, we'll have to see. I don't know. I can't. There are so many candidates standing. But uh, the kind of political impact which the mayor of Manchester has been able to give hasn't escaped people, I think, in Whitehall. So they know if they go down the route uh, that you suggest, Andrew, which I can see the attractions of it to avoid the outcome they wish to avoid in Scottish independence, they'll have to do something very substantial for northern uh, self-government, uh, uh, regional, so whether it's regional or northern, uh, who knows, uh, uh, and of course for Wales, more or less peri passu with whatever they give in Scotland. And I just wonder whether that isn't, from their point of view, the worst of all worlds. Yeah, and I'm glad you came back to Wales, and I think that that's an interesting point, and we're seeing a shift here because I think Wales has been a source of in some ways, constitutional ideas for how do we hold the UK together? You know, the, the Welsh government has been interested in ideas around a, 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 a quasi-federal system for the UK in a way that I don't think any of the other governments have been interested. But if we're seeing a shift in Wales, that to me looks quite significant towards independence. Thank you. We've covered a lot of ground. That's been been really interesting. Thanks a lot for your time today. Well, hopefully we can get back together and uh, talk about these issues again soon. No doubt there'll be, there'll be more developments in the meantime. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.